Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Kelvin Lecture for 2023. Many of you will be aware that Lord Kelvin was twice the president of this society. A couple of hundred years ago, uh, back then, there's a Newtonian view of the world. Cause and effect are all very clearly understood. Effect follows cause. Nice and straightforward. Einstein came along a bit later, came up with relativity and came up with photoelectric effects and started confusing things with the birth of quantum mechanics. Tonight's speaker is a professor in optics. He's also the Kelvin chair of uh, natural philosophy here at the University of Glasgow. He has numerous awards, including the Kelvin Medal from the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And he's here tonight to give us his Kelvin lecture on titled, Does God Play Dice? Please welcome Professor Miles Paget. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry to have caused a few people a little bit of panic. First of all, with my rather late arrival, I may have been the last person to arrive and then with some AV issues, but they've all been sorted. So we're all going to be good. So as you said, I, my name is Miles Paget. I work here at the University of Glasgow and it's a privilege to be speaking in front of you all this evening. Now, I. The title of my talk is, Does God Play Dice? And let's, let's try and understand where that came from. And I'm going to give some bits of history. I'm going to sort of try and resolve the question as well. Let's see how that goes. So the, the term, Does God Play Dice? is a misquote from Albert Einstein. So why did, why did Einstein say that? And what he was worried about were the fundamental laws by which the universe works. And the sort of two worldviews. One worldview is, because I can do lots of clever calculations, not me, but people, that if I can really measure what we have now very carefully, then I can predict the future. A little bit like weather forecasting. If I want to predict the weather tomorrow, the starting point for that is let's measure it very carefully today. And then I can wind my computer program forward in time and I can predict tomorrow, the next day, the day after that. And we can think about what the limits for that might be and how well we can measure the here and now. And Einstein thought that you could do that. You can measure now, predict the future. Nothing is left to chance. Now he recognized, however, that there's a problem with that. It's called the uncertainty principle that I'm sure many of you have heard of which is if I measure the position of something very, very precisely, I can no longer measure its velocity. Or if I measure the velocity, I can already, I can't measure the position. And so you can see that straight away, the Einstein model of the future comes unstuck because quantum mechanics just tells us very fundamentally that I cannot measure everything at the same time. And why can I not do that? I'm going to use you as a prop. Because if I look at you and see where you are, light is bouncing off you. And light has momentum, and so the light will push you away. So the very act of looking at you changes you in some way. So I can't do anything about it. I'm always going to mess up things that I measure slightly. So to some extent, Einstein's view was a little sort of how many angels are there on the head of a pin. Because <laughs> on the one hand, he goes, well, if I knew everything, I would be able to predict the future. On the other hand, he goes, I know I can't know everything. Therefore, I can't predict the future. 
The other point of view was Ball, Niels Ball, and he said, Einstein, you're wrong. Probably didn't say it quite so bluntly, but let's assume. Actually, the future is inherently probabilistic. What does that mean? It means that I do the same experiment twice. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Pretty much describes my life in the lab, that. But not due to my imperfection as an experimenter. It's just that you drop the boil, the thingy of water on your hand. Sometimes it goes to the left, sometimes it goes to the right. So Bohr believed that the future had an inherently random element from which there was no escape. Even if I worked out how to measure your position without disturbing you, I'm still buggered. I can't, I can't predict the future. And Einstein said, God does not play dice, meaning God does not sit there going, is it heads, is it tails? Now, that wasn't a religious statement he was making. It was a philosophical statement about the way the universe works. Does random chance play a role in the future? Bohr said yes. Einstein said no. Well, that's the summary of my entire lecture. But now we'll start with reading. So I'm going to try and take us through Einstein's argument, and I'm going to try and take you through some of the experimental evidence and philosophical considerations that have got us where we have today. And actually, what I'm in essence referring to is the Nobel Prize of last year. OK, so the no, not this year, but last year, the Nobel Prize was award, awarded to Alan Aspey and Anton Zeilinger and John Clauser for their resolution of this problem. Okay, so it's in that sense, it's quite current. And so I'm going to talk about effectively what the Nobel Prize was for last year. So I'm going to talk about a bit about wave particle duality. I'm going to talk about the role of the observer. What role do you and I play in quantum mechanics? I'm going to try, as I've done already, to re explain what it was that Einstein did not like about quantum mechanics, and I'm going to go, well, what, what do modern experiments say about this problem? So, in 1905, Einstein published not one, not two, not three, but four papers, gosh, that changed the world. I'm going to say a little bit about what those four papers are and what about them in particular. So the first paper he published in 1905 was uh, his paper on relativity, special relativity. And what he said was that the speed of light is a constant. It's a phrase we've often heard. Why would, that be an, why would that be a strange thing to say? If I had a, I don't have a gun, clearly, but if I had a gun and I could shoot a bullet over there and the bullet goes at 100 miles an hour, and then if I run along and fire the bullet again, it goes at 103 miles an hour, because I was running at three miles an hour. Okay, the velocities add. And actually, Michelson and Morley had shown in experiments at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 1900s that actually wasn't the case. Light behaved differently to that. That if I stood here still and fired a torch over there, light traveled off at the speed of light. If I ran along with the torch, thinking I could make the light go faster, I couldn't. The speed of light was a constant. And from that rather bizarre statement, all kinds of things change. And I'm not going to explain relativity tonight, but to say that there are things we sort of think we remember about relativity, which when, when things go quicker, they get shorter. It's called length contraction. If I pick up a clock and start moving it at high velocity, 
it ticks more slowly. And in fact, we know that that's true now because the GPS satellites, you know, the satellite that allows Google Maps to tell me where I am, those are, those are actually clocks in space that get, they go round and round the Earth's orbit. And they actually tick more slowly than clocks here on Earth. And if we didn't allow for that, GPS wouldn't work. So we know that relativity is true. Moving clocks tick more slowly. Moving meter rulers no longer a meter long. And that's a consequence of that underlying truth that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Very complicated stuff. Doesn't matter. That was one paper for which he never won the Nobel Prize. Okay? Bit of a bit of a robbery, that one. There was another paper he wrote, which was understanding Brownian motion. Now, does anyone know where Dr. Brown worked? Just out of interest. Sorry? He was a Scot. At the Glasgow Uni. Yes, getting good so far. Worked in the Botanic Gardens, I believe. And uh, so Brownian motion was so called because when people look at things in a microscope, you find that everything jiggles around a little bit. And, and people didn't know whether that was because the things were alive and they were swimming around. And so Brown did the sensible thing, ground up some stone, put some stone flakes in, looked down and went, no, they're still moving. So it's nothing to do with them being alive. And people didn't really understand why that was. Why is it that when I look at small things in a microscope, they jiggle around? And Einstein realized it was because they were constantly being bombarded by mo air molecules, that the air was not a fluid. The air was made up of lots of little red balls, or well, not really little red balls, but lots of atoms. And those little atoms bumped into things. And if the things were little enough themselves, those other things would sort of jiggle around. So Einstein understood Brownian motion. And that was one, that was the second paper he published in 1905, for which he did not win the Nobel Prize either. Now, this is another paper that he published. It's a bit of a bizarre paper. It's called Understanding the Photoelectric Effect. So what was the photoelectric effect? So the photoelectric effect is what sort of happens in a sort of light bulby thing where I've got a big bit of metal here, I've got a big bit of metal there, and it's in a vacuum. It's an old light bulb in a vacuum. And I connect a battery, and the electrons come out the battery, go around the wire, get back to this bit of metal, but they can't get across because the two bits of metal don't jump up, don't meet. So it's like a broken circuit there. And um, people had shown, so the electrons are coming out of the battery at the bottom and they're going round to the big orange thing that says negative because electrons are charged negative. And, and nothing happens. And then you can get a torch out and you shine the light onto that, it's called an electrode, that, that piece of metal. And in this case, the light's red light and nothing happens. And you shine more red light, really crank up the intensity, nothing happens. Doesn't matter how much red light you have, doesn't matter how much energy is in that red light, still nothing happens. And then you shine on a little bit of blue light and all of a sudden electrons start escaping and I get a current flow. So somehow blue light can, I'm going to say boil off electrons, wrong term, but you get the idea. Red light can't do it. It's not to do with the intensity. It's not to do with the power. Blue light is fundamentally different from red light. And from this, Einstein deduced that light itself came in particles. We call them photons now. The term photon was not invented till about the 1930s. So we called it quanta, light quanta. And so that light was particulate. It's called the photoelectric effect. And it is for the photoelectric effect that Einstein won the Nobel Prize subsequently. 
not relativity, not Brownian motion, photoelectric effect. And from this, we deduce that light was quantized. It came in lumps. And incidentally, it's, the lumps aren't very big. If I had a little laser pointer in my hand now, it would produce something like 20 to the, 10 to the 12, a million million lumps of light a second, just to give you some kind of idea as to how small these lumps are. Incidentally, you can now buy cameras that can see those individual lumps arrive one by one. So we know that light arrives in lumps of energy or quanta. But we also know that light behaves sometimes as a wave. We sometimes talk about the wavelength of the light. My wave. A red laser has got a wavelength of 632 nanometers. Uh, uh, that's about half a million millionth. No, no, half a millionth of a millimeter. So small. So one might think when talks about quantum that the thing that makes quantum spooky is that sometimes light seems to be a particle. And at other times, light appears to be a wave. It's got a name. Of course, it has a name. <laughs> wave particle duality. And we sometimes think that's a bit odd, but that's certainly not what people mean when they say quantum is spooky. Both Einstein and Bohr went, yep, yeah, that's right. Sometimes light looks like a particle and sometimes it looks like a wave. Sometimes I've got dark hair and sometimes I'm quite tall. You know, it doesn't, I mean, you know, just these are different things. And actually, at the end of the day, light does whatever light does. We choose to describe it as a particle or we choose to describe it as a wave. It says more about us than it does about the light. Light just does what it does. Now, Let's talk a little bit about the wave property, however, because this is important. Light is not the only wave that we understand. We know that light, I've got sound waves. You're listening to me now. The, diff, the wavelength of the sound, the frequency of the sound, the speed of the sound. The speed of the sound is about 300 meters a second. My voice is about 300 hertz, maybe. That means the wavelength is about a meter. So sound is a wave. I can have water waves. I can have earthquake waves. I can have gravitational waves. I can have waves of all kinds of things. I can also have light waves. Now, so let's stick with the wave and try and understand. If I said to you, or if you said to me, Miles, you tell me light's a wave, prove it. How can I prove it to you that light is a wave? And so if anyone said to you, is this a wave? This is what I would ask. If you told me that taste was a wave, as in taste, I'd go, really? Prove it to me. And you'd go, how would you like me to prove it to you? So this is how I, want, this is how I would ask you to prove it to me. Um, <clears throat> one plus one equals excellent. I can see I can see you've been listening. That's great. Um, so waves are a bit odd because when I have two waves and they come together, two two crests come together. I get a crest which is twice as high. Okay. On the other hand, I can have two light beams coming together and a crest comes together with a trough and then get darkness that is cancel out. So sometimes one plus one, it seems, equals zero. Hmm. Okay, that's fine. Now, what would I do here? So I could have a source of waves here. And I could have a source of waves here. And they're doing it, they're the same frequency. Ooh, this is excellent. And I come here 
and they add up. And in the middle, I get crest plus crest. I go over there now. Coming towards you, that one's coming towards you. But that one's had to travel further. So now, by the time they get to you, this one's a crest and this one's a trough. Hmm. Oh dear. So I get nothing. I go further. This one's a crest and this one's traveled so far, it's come back to crest again. Oh, they add up again. So if I have a light source here and a light source here, and I add them together, what I get in front of me is a stripey pattern. As I move from side to side, and I can work out exactly how far apart those stripes are, everything's fine. And I can make, you know, if it's light waves, my stripes are probably going to be a millimeter apart. I could do the same trick. It's much harder. It sounds like it should work easy. It doesn't work easy. Otherwise, I would show you. But I could put my iPhone here and it'd be going, bee. I put my iPhone here and it's going, bee. Excellent. And I could, you know, if I then move my ear around, I could go, oh, they add up here. I can hear the volume. Oh, they don't add up here. Oh, they do add up here. Little experiment to try if you happen to own two iPhones. Thank you very much for charging mine up, by the way. Um, so, so that's the important thing. Waves do something that particles never do. Sometimes waves add up to give me zero. It's called interference. But it's not what confused Einstein and Bohr. Now, there's an, there's, a, there's an example of this. It's quite strange because now I've got my, I, I, for some reason, those two slits have come out as dark blue. They're meant to come out as white. How do I do this experiment in practice? I don't have two light beams here and here. I take a piece of card and I cut two holes in it. And then I, I illuminate it from the back. This is how back in the, the, the Middle Ages, people did interference. They let, they let the sunlight through the curtain. The sunlight hit my piece of card. My card had two holes in it. Some of the sunlight went through the left hole. Some of the sunlight went through the right hole. And then I would get interference. And you go, well, that's fine. But you also told me, Miles, that, that, the, that the light is also a particle. So what happens? That's fine. I've got lots of particles. Some of the particles go through the right slit. Some of the particles go through the left slit. They all interfere, and I get my stripy pattern. And I go, okay, I'll turn the light source down. Now. I'm going to have to turn it down a long way, because you remember, even a laser pointer is a billion photons a second. So I'm talking about really dark stuff. And you go, well, that's going to be great, but what about when you only have one photon, Miles? When you only have one photon, it either goes through the right slit or it goes through the left slit. How can, you, how can I still get an interference pattern? And I go, well, you do. And you conclude that this photon went through both slits. And you go, okay, so that's what makes quantum mechanics spooky. And Einstein and Bohr went, no, 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 that's fine. And you're like, really? They said, yeah, yeah, you're just obsessing over what you mean by particle or what you mean by wave. Don't stress about it. It's because you're constrained in your thinking, Miles. It, that's what happens. Okay, okay, fine. Again, let's not get bogged down in that. So that wave-particle duality is really strange. But it's not the problem. It's not the problem with quantum mechanics. I'm going to try and now explain what the problem is in quantum mechanics. So let's, um, we're gonna, I'm going to, I'm going to, and a shame of, I'm English, by the way. So I'm going to use a cricket analogy because we're so good at cricket. And um, I'm going to think not of the slits, I'm going to think of the wickets. Okay, I've got three, I've got the, I've got the bright bit here, that's the sense of the middle stump. I've got the dark bit here, I've got a bright bit over here, that's the leg stump and that's the off stump over there, okay? So I, I've got three fringes, and I could have five fringes or seven fringes or nine fringes, doesn't matter. 
I'm just going to talk about three fringes. And I start off here. And my photon comes along, passes through both slits somehow. And it's going to hit the screen. Where? Well, I'm going to measure it somewhere. It's going to hit the screen somewhere. And the answer is going to be it either hits the off stump, the middle stump, or the leg stump. And I don't know which is going to be. It's a probability. It's a third, a third, a third. So at that point now, it's a little bit like we're in the Einstein Bohr space of gosh, the universe is going to have to get a three sided coin and flick it and go middle stump. It's going to have to make some probabilistic determination. And it's that probabilistic determination which is the problem. So let's have a look and, and see whether I can try and explain it a little bit more clearly. So that now, those are my three, not the slits, okay? The slits are over here. The photons have gone through both slits. They've created that interference pattern. Crest with crest in the middle. Then we've got the sort of blank bit, that's crest with trough. And then at the far left hand, we've got crest with crest. And on the far right, we've got crest with crest. Everyone comfortable, happy-ish? And that's the intensity. Now, then you're going to get into sort of the quantum science or the wave mechanics or anything else you want to say. That intensity is also the probability distribution of the next photon. So I'm going to send one more photon in, and I do not know where it goes, but it's a 33% chance it goes to the left, 33% chance it goes to the middle. 33% chance it goes to the right. And you can do those experiments, you can see those experiments, and you can see those photons arriving as little flashes of light on your camera, one by one. And eventually, once you've shone enough photons into the system, you get, you know, equal numbers in the three stripes. But make no mistake, when the first photon arrived, in that case, it arrived in the center. I don't know if you saw that. It's just going to it'll always arrive in the center because it's a PowerPoint animation. <laughs> but it could have arrived wrote everywhere. That, that sort of schematic there is exactly what you would see on a camera. It wouldn't look quite like that because there wouldn't be red stars. Be, but you, you, you know what I mean. So that is what one sees. And the question that Einstein and Bohr debated is when is that coin flipped? When is it flipped? So let's think of different possibilities. A long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, Someone was designing the future universe, someone, something, some it. And it knew that at eight o'clock on the 13th of December, is it the 13th today? 2023, a photon was going to be released. And pre programmed into that existence, predetermined into that existence, it knew it was going to go to the center fringe. Okay, that would be one possibility. A bit bizarre, but, you know, can't think of anything much before that. It could be, just now I'm going to make a photon. Pop, that photon comes into existence. And at that point it goes, ha ha, I know what Miles is going to do. It's going to launch me at these two slits. And when he does that, I'm going to go through both slits and I'm going to go to the center fringe. Could do that. Could be I release a photon. It goes through the slits. And as it goes through the slits, it goes, oh, gosh, I better get diffracting. I better get interfering with myself. I know I'm going to go to the center fringe. Okay. Could be later. 
photon could go through the slits. It could fringe. It could, it could be traveling. It could go, oh, good grief, I'm about to hit a screen. I'm going to have to decide where on the screen I'm going to go. Rolls a little dice. Oh, I'll go to the center fringe. Could be that I'm going to hit the screen. I'm going to be somewhere. And I'm not going to decide until Miles decides to look at me. And when Miles looks at me, when Miles observes me, because he's a professor of physics, I better make my mind up. I can no longer be a third, a third, a third. I'm going to have to, because it's going to measure me somewhere. I have to decide. And so on the one hand, we have a sort of pre-programmed universe where everything that ever happened and is ever going to happen has been defined by those initial conditions of measuring the weather very well back at the moment of the Big Bang. And then we predict the weather forevermore. Or the very latest it could be is after I've observed it. Now, there's more subtleties there because maybe I don't observe it. Maybe I take a picture of it and then I put my phone away and I don't look at the picture until tomorrow morning. So when was it observed? Did my camera observe it? Or is the observation tomorrow morning when I look at the camera picture? Maybe I ask you to look for me. Could you look for me, but don't tell me till tomorrow? Okay. Open my exam results, but please don't tell me what they're going to hear. Remember, remember that. I, look at my exam results, Mum, please. But only tell me if it's good news. I don't know how that was going to end. But, and then you go, are you a qualified, are you a qualified observer? You know, what counts as an observer? Is, I, am I an observer? Are you an observer? Is my camera an observer? I don't know. So there's all kinds of philosophical questions there about what we regard as an observation. So lots of complicated stuff, and I haven't answered it yet. But hopefully, I have tried to illustrate what the problem is. The problem is not wave particle duality. That was easy. Ish. It's not which slit did the photon go through. That was easy. Ish. It's when do does that probability get decided? Now, I should say. So this is it. In wave particle duality, the distribution of the particles is determined by their wave-like properties. If you want to reconcile wave particle duality. <laughs> Whenever you observe it, it's a particle. Whenever you're trying to predict what it's going to do, it's a wave. So you use the wave mechanics to predict the outcome. That outcome sets a probabilistic distribution, and then you flip the coin, and it's a particle. So there's a problem. There's many problems. And this is called the Schrodinger cat paradox. So let's pretend that I've got my three fringes, dum, 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 and the middle one has got a bottle of poison gas. Hmm. But it's very fragile. So my photon comes along and it goes to the left. Phew, no problem. It goes to the right. Phew, no problem. Goes to the middle. Bad news. Poison gas is going to be released. And the cat next to the bottle is going to die. That's why it's a showing the cat paradox. But I'm not going to come in until tomorrow morning. So actually, the observation will take place tomorrow morning. So between now and tomorrow morning, the cat has got a two thirds chance of being alive and a one third chance of being dead. And so it's half cat or in this case, two-thirds live cat, one-third dead cat. And you go, that's bonkers. That's ridiculous. We're sort of happy that the photon can do its stuff. I come back tomorrow morning and go, oh, yes, the photon was in the middle fringe. That's fine. I know I released it last night, but overnight it was two-thirds okay and one-third in the middle. And somehow it's okay for photons to behave that way because they're a bit odd. But the cat's not a bit odd. 
So that's the kind of issues people have with this idea of delayed choice or delayed outcome. Or I did the experiment, but I didn't measure what it had done until the morning. And somehow overnight, it hadn't quite decided. There's a nice little cartoon here. Clearly, this is not an experiment that one could actually do for various good reasons. Now, and this led Einstein with his, uh, with his colleagues, um, Podolsky and Rosen, to write this paper, which is Can Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete? Because there's nothing in quantum mechanics that gets you away from this probabilistic view of the world. It's a third, a third, a third. And when we observe it, we're going to roll the dice and we'll see what happens. And Einstein didn't like that. He said that quantum mechanics cannot be the whole story. There has to be something else. There are some hidden inner workings where this is all decided at some previous time or some subtle the way you did the experiment. You know, it's a little bit like... Um, Hawkeye or whatever, the, 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 you know, the thing that can predict where the, <laughs> when, the, when the bats person gets in the, in the way and blocks the ball and then they run the video machine to go, well, if the batter hadn't been there, it would have hit the middle stump, you're out. You know, that, that doesn't exist. But so, so that's what this paper was about, which was written in 1935. Turned out one of these three people was a Soviet spy. <laughs> Wasn't Einstein? But we'll leave it there. In fact, I, I, this is God's honest truth. So they, the, the MI5 knew they had a spy. It wasn't MI5 then. And we knew we had a spy. And we knew the code name for the spy, but we didn't know who the spy was. Their code name was Quantum. You'd have thought they could have <laughs> at least called some people in for questioning, but never mind. So let's talk about the einstein bohr debate. So Einstein thought that outcome, left, middle, right, live cat, dead cat, whatever, was somehow encoded very subtly in the starting conditions, the initial conditions, a bit like the weather forecasting. If I measure everything very well here and I know exactly where the photon is, and I know exactly direction, and I know exactly the design of the slits, and I know exactly where the screen is, I can sit down and I can work it out that this photon is going to go to the left fringe. And then he went, but I know I can't because the universe is a bit fuzzy. I've got the uncertainty principle. I can't measure it that well. So he didn't think you could predict the future in, a, in practice, but he thought at some hidden level the future was encoded in the present get that so this is not i can predict the future <laughs> okay now Bohr didn't think that so so this hidden is really important einstein's theory was called a hidden variable theory so it is predictable the weather forecast is predictable it's just that the starting conditions are hidden. Therefore, I cannot predict the future. God does not play dice with nature. Now, hopefully you understand why he said that. And Bohr said he did. Okay. Now, one never knows what people that are no longer with us thought. So we don't really, I'm going to say Einstein thought this, Bohr thought that. Hey, they're not here for us to ask them. So we, we can only surmise what they thought. So they disagreed fundamentally because Bohr said, nope, it's all random. It's a third, a third, a third. There's nothing you can do to predict the future. That's just the way it is. Einstein said, no, that's not true. God doesn't play dice with nature. It is predictable. It's just that we can't measure it well enough to predict it. 
So neither of them thought it was predictable. <laughs> okay. They were in perfect agreement that the future could not be predicted. They just disagreed on why it couldn't be predicted. And so it seems that they were thinking that they were thinking about philosophy. They were thinking about the number of angels on the head of the pin and whether they preferred the right-hand side or the left-hand side. I mean, as if one would ever know. They thought they were arguing about philosophy and it was untestable. And that then changed thanks to this man called John Bell, who I did meet once. I did my PhD. He came to the laboratory and he gave us a seminar, and nobody understood a single word that he uttered. Okay? He was very clever. Very clever. Nice guy as well, actually. Really nice guy from Northern Ireland, as it happens. And uh, didn't have a, no, I'm literally, I was at the, I did my PhD in the Cavendish in Cambridge and he came and spoke to us just after the experiments to prove, and I, I kid you not, maybe one person, Brian Pippard, who's very smart, asked a question. We all went, oh, bloody hell, Brian understood what was happening. No one else had an absolute scooby clue what he was on about, but we knew it was important. So, hey. <laughs> So now I'm going to try and explain to you. So he devised this test, which was called the Bell Inequality, which allowed you to distinguish between something that was not known from something that was not knowable. <laughs> if you think about that, this is and this is how it worked. <laughs> so I'm now going to explain polarization. <laughs> And I realize I'm getting a bit short of time. Uh, I've got my horizontally polarized light. It's coming up to my polarized sunglasses. And when the light's horizontally polarized, it's transmitted. I've now got, so my wave, my, my light wave coming towards you, either wiggles from side to side like that, or it wiggles up and down like that. And light from the sun, by the way, has both. It wiggles up and down and it wiggles from side to side. The vertically polarized light doesn't come through. That's how your Polaroid sunglasses work. Because light that bounces off the snow is vertically polarized, therefore does not go through your sunglasses. The light that comes directly from the sun, some of it's horizontally polarized and does go through your sunglasses. That's why Polaroid sunglasses cut down the reflection from the snow or the water. Now that's sort of interesting and you go fine. What about light at 45 degrees? What about light that wiggles, not like this or like that, but at 45 degrees? What happens then? Well, half of it gets through. So that's not a surprise. But the half that gets through is now horizontally polarized. Hmm. Now, that seems a bit odd. Why is that? Well, it's because light that's polarized at 45 degrees is actually made up of equal amounts of light some of it's vertically polarized like that, and some of it's horizontally polarized. And I've already told you that the vertically polarized light doesn't come through. So all I'm left with is the half that was horizontal. So it's not rocket science. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, let's think about now at the level of single photons. My horizontally polarized photon always gets through because horizontally polarized light gets through the polarizer. My vertically polarized photon never gets through because vertically polarized light doesn't get through the polarizer. Well, well what about the one at 45 degrees? Well, I can't have half a photon. So either the photon gets through or it doesn't. Half the time it doesn't, half the time it does. But when it does, it's horizontally polarized. Now, why am I telling you this? So if I'm sitting here on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, one of two things happens. I either measure a horizontally polarized photon or I measure nothing. If I measure a horizontally polarized photon, that could be because of two different reasons. Reason one could be that the incident photon was horizontally polarized and it got through. 
Or it could be that the incoming photon was polarized at 45 degrees and it got lucky and got through. It, it rolled the dice, heads or tails, heads got through. I don't know. So it's quite interesting that I don't know. I can measure now, but I don't actually know what happened previously. Quite a powerful statement. Two different inputs had the same output. I measure the output. I do not know which two inputs it was. Now, when does the photon decide whether to get through the polarizer or not? It seems obvious, doesn't it? The photon comes along at 45 degrees, hits the polarizer, goes, oh, I'm going to have to decide, flip the coin, oh, heads, I'm going through, or tails, I'm not. Seems perfectly logical. Sounds so obvious it has to be true. Turns out not to be. I shall show you why. So, and now we're going to get on to the wonderful work of Alan Aspey, Anton Seilinger, John Clauser. There are special light sources, which I won't describe, but I'll describe what they do. If I have a light bulb, the photons come out one by one. Okay, they come out very quickly, and I get millions of them, billions of them every second. But fundamentally, the photons come out one by one. You can take a different kind of light source where the photons always come out two by two. It's a little bit like Noah's Ark in reverse, I suppose. But, and in this case, the two photons come out. One of them goes to the left. The other one goes to the right. And I can watch that all day long, and it will just carry on doing that. And I go, well, that's interesting. And then there's all kinds of conservation of energy. <laughs> That means they come out at the same time, okay? There's conservation of momentum. So if one of them comes out heading upwards, the other one comes out heading downwards. Again, I would notice that. I could see that. It's called correlation, and it happens because of conservation. I noticed something else about these photons. They come out with opposite polarizations. So if I measure one of them, is polarized vertically, I notice that the other one is always polarized horizontally. If I notice that one of them comes out polarized 45 degrees one way, the other one always comes out 45 degrees the other way. It's because of conservation, but it almost doesn't matter. It's what I observe to be true. These photons always come out with opposite polarizations. I can't change that. If one of them's slanting to the left, the other one's slanting to the right. Now, we're going to add a polarizer. And we're going to play a little game, which is we're going to try and predict whether the photon goes through or doesn't go through. So when the photon comes out polarized, vertically it never goes through when it's horizontal it always goes through and when it's at 45 degrees either way it's a 50 50. does that make sense just watch the photons on the right hand side i'm going to run it again when the photon comes through at 45 degrees you don't know what's going to happen it's a fluke 50 percent one way or the other way when it's horizontally polarized it always gets through when it's vertically polarized, it never gets through. And whenever it gets through, the bit you see is always horizontal. So let's just watch it one more time. And if we understand this bit, I promise you we're going to get to the end and understand everything. So 50-50. No. Yes. 50-50. Yes. 50 50. No. 50 50. No. No. Yes. 50 50. No. 50 50. Yes. Do you get the pattern? Do you get it? We know what's going to happen. Now, guess what I'm going to do now? What do you think I'm going to do now? I'm going to add another polarizer on the other side. 
Incidentally, that's a nice picture of Einstein and Bohr. I think they're watching Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> I can't quite tell. Maybe it's a football match. So the question is, when does the photon decide what to do? Einstein said it's all decided at the, you know, at the beginning. It's all predictable. Bohr went, nope, 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 nope. It's a decided only at the point of observation, not when it goes through the polarizer, at the point of observation. Now, let's think about what that's going to mean. And the question I'm going to ask myself is I put these two polarizers here. And the question I ask is do I ever get lucky twice? Because in a probabilistic world, that photon comes out, it's at 45 degrees. It hits this polarizer and there's a 50-50 chance it gets through. That's what I said. So if I flip heads, it goes through. Same thing's true on this side. Now, if I have two coins, I don't have any coins because hey, post COVID, none of us carry any money with us anymore. If I have two coins and I flip them, sometimes I'm going to get two heads, which means sometimes I'm going to get lucky and I'm going to get a photon through both polarizers. This is an Einstein view of the world. So let's look at that. This is the Einstein view. The horizontal vertical cases are really boring because one of them's going to get through, the other one isn't. The interesting case is when they're both polarized at 45 degrees. Look, I got lucky. 45, oh, didn't get anything. 45, got one of them, but not the other. That's like heads, tails. Boring, that one. Boring, that one. Don't care. Interesting, oh, didn't get either of them. Interesting, got both of them. Yeah, do you get it? Okay. Is that all I'm doing is I'm just flipping coins and going, do I ever get heads on both of them? And one in four times I do, and that means I get a double count. Einstein, all of us here went, yeah, no problem. Sounds pretty sensible to me. But let's look at the Bohr. Bohr says you don't know what the polarization is. It hasn't made up its mind. The only time it makes up its mind is when you observe it. So when I observe that one to be horizontal, the other one is always opposite, yeah? Therefore, it's vertical. Therefore, it didn't get through. What? So I never get two heads because my coins are, are entangled. They are always going to be the opposite. So when I flip heads on this one, I'm always going to flip tails on that one. So I don't get through. So now, this question of philosophy as to when is it that the thing makes up its mind, does it make up its mind in the experiment or is it only at the point of observation is now experimentally testable. And so uh, Alan Aspey, I don't want to delay us. He's a fascinating, lovely, lovely man. Um, I could tell a little Alan Aspey story, which is quite funny. So I love him to pieces. He cares about people. He cares about careers. He cares about the places in which we work. I cannot think more highly of him. Not every Nobel Prize winner is a nice person, but he is. Anyway, I, so I'm now going to have a joke at his expense. Okay. I, two, several things. I saw him just the other week as it happened. I, when I was young, was deciding what to do. And I couldn't decide. I was going to be a school teacher, which is fine. For me, not so good for the schools, probably. But and I was walking across, I was walking through campus, and I was listening to the radio, and I heard about this young French guy who had just proved Einstein wrong. Okay, and I was like, wow, this is incredible. So people are still doing physics, are they? Oh, I thought it had all been done before. Right? And so I decided at that point I was going to become a researcher. This is true, true, true. I decided I was going to become a research scientist, just on the basis of that right research program, just on the basis of that radio program. And then many years later, my colleague Steve Barnett at Strathclyde said to me one evening, he said, oh, by the way, Miles, Alan Aspey is visiting us. And uh, we're going down to the pub tonight. Do you want to, um, do you want to come down? I was like, shocked and grief, you know, way, it's the sky blue, I'm down, I'm coming, Steve. And so I worked, I walked down, 
I went into the pub and Alain was there with he had a very impressive moustache, was French at that time, curly, 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 almost like onion rings and like two. I mean, stereotypical French. And I said, oh, I said, uh, and I was an early career researcher. I said, oh, you're Alain Aspe. And he looked up at me and said, you're Miles Paget. And I was like, oh. and then he said to me, he said, I've just read your most recent paper. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Imagine what that feels like when your hero says that to you. Uh, so I still makes me have things on the back of my neck. Anyway, many years later, he said, "Well, you must come and give my department a seminar uh, and his impacts. Of course he is. And so I took him over there and he said, oh, I said, Miles, I could take you out to eat tonight, but you know, I like to cook and maybe you could come round to my house and my wife and I will cook for you. And I thought, oh, fantastic, great, great, great. So we toodle around and he takes me down into his wine cellar, because of course he has a wine cellar. <laughs> and uh, he goes, Miles, he said, I just want you to pick any, any bottle of wine that you feel that you would like, and we will drink it tonight to celebrate your tour. Was it? I said, oh, no. I said, I'm, I'm too temple. I don't drink. I said, but thank you. And he looked at me in this eye. Like, oh. <laughs> and he just said, I remember he said, you're not a vegetarian too. <laughs> Uh, I said, no, 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 full grog, bring it on, I'm fine, but no, I just don't drink. Anyway, so there's a picture of Alan a few years ago, and you can see he has a very fine moustache, and he's a super guy. And so he did these experiments back in 1980s and proved that Einstein was indeed wrong, that actually outcome was only determined at point of observation and not before. Now, he didn't answer the question whether you count or I count or the camera counts. That's still an unknown. Great Nobel Prize there for somebody if they can work out how to do that. But he disproved Einstein. Einstein's view was wrong. All was right. It seems the universe is not predetermined. You do not know what your exam results are until you open the envelope. And at that point, the wave function collapse and you know the answer. So, on, on that happy note, I've gone on a few minutes longer than I wanted, but um, anyway, and I'm delighted, I was so happy, every year I predicted that he was going to win the Nobel Prize, like a stopped clock, you know, eventually you get the right time, and I was delighted that last year he did, it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy, so on that happy note, I will stop. Okay, so if you have any questions, then please raise your hands. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A tab. So I'm sorry, I overran. If anyone needs to go, they should just go without any inhibit inhib inhibition. I can shout out the question out loudly if you want to just tell me. Hello, one, oh. two, three. Yeah. I'm hesitating asking this question in case it's just like a really, really stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If um, Einstein was so hung up on um, the, the being, being able to predict things, that depends on a kind of linear causality, doesn't it? But a linear causality depends on a prior cause. And anyone who's done any basic philosophy will realize that that's just one aspect of time because a prior cause has to stop somewhere. And so it's only one aspect of time. So surely Einstein is basing that assumption on a partial understanding of time. Pass. <laughs> so so I, I'm not sure I know the, the answer to that. I think, um, I think Einstein's saving grace on that one is that not even he thought the future was predictable because we could not measure the here and now, that the laws of physics stopped us from measuring the here and now, which meant, given that we didn't know the here and now, he could not predict the future. <laughs> and this, this whole dichotomy between Bohr and Einstein is not that one of them thought they could predict the future, 
But one of them thought it was unknown, and the other one thought it was unknowable, if you, if you, if you see what I mean, which I think is a more, a slightly more subtle. And um, even at a very, very simple level, so we're not talking about anything as complicated as the weather, <laughs> which has lots of possible outcomes. We're talking about, in the case of the polarizer, it's just two outcomes. I mean, it's an incredibly simple system. It either gets through or it doesn't. So I'm not disagreeing with you at all, and I'm not sure we should talk about it afterwards. I just think that probably applies to more complicated systems than we're in the, what are called two-state systems. So, yeah. Okay, uh, we have a question from online from Alistair McDonald. How confident are you about the uncertainty principle? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there must be a joke there. <laughs> uh, I'm actually pretty confident. Well, I mean, we think the uncertainty principle is quantum. It isn't actually quantum at all. And at, at some level, it's sort of... Okay, let me... I'm going to be a clock. And you're going to tell me how accurate the clock is. Okay. And I'm going to go tick once a second. Tick, tick, tick. Now, what you're going to do, you're going to sit there with your watch. And you're going to go through 10 seconds and count the number of ticks I do. And you know what the answer is going to be? Probably going to be 10. But actually, if you got unlucky, it would only be nine because of just the timing and the thing. And if you got lucky, you might get 11. And so this idea that there is an uncertainty in measurement. And so that is, uh, I talked about, I mean, everyone knows the uncertainty principle in terms of if I measure the position, I cannot measure the velocity. It's also true that if I measure time, I cannot measure energy. And energy is frequency. And so if I only measure my clock for 10 seconds, the error in my measurement, it turns out, is 1 over 10. And that's why it might be 9, might be 11, might be 10, if you see what I mean. So this thing that we call the uncertainty principle, although we usually talk about it in a quantum context, is just maths in that sense. And the other example would be, you know, and this is not entirely a joke. If you want to, if you want to play a flute, something like a flute is a very pure tone, and you go, my flute might be slightly out of tune, and you have perfect pitch. How can I yeah, smudge it? Just play very quickly. And if the note doesn't last long enough, it's not out of tune. You notice a note is out of tune the longer it, the longer it goes on. And so this idea of frequency and time uncertainty are hand in hand. So in that sense, the, the, the strange thing about, about the uncertainty principle is not the uncertainty between time and frequency or between position and momentum. The curious thing actually about that sort of maths is the link between wavelength and momentum. So it's the it's called the de Broglie relationship shortest physics thesis ever written i think it was two pages for a phd not bad going such was its uh, profound impact on the world so the consensus is amongst most scientists that the uncertainty principle is fine where people disagree and people still do disagree is yeah this is fine for photons but what about cats <laughs> you know and then you go, oh, well, photons, cats, I get the difference. How about a molecule? Mm. How about a virus? Mm. How about a small microscopic creature? At what point does it cease to be quantum and start to be common sense? And uh, can I really leave the cat in a half live dead state overnight? Or can I only do it for a fraction of a second. So whether there's theories whereby people go, yes, this ambiguity 
itself collapses after a certain time, depending on the mass of the system, as it turns out. But no one's ever done any experiments in that area that, that, that have proved these things one way or the other. It's just unknown. Roger Penrose, who won the Nobel Prize hmm, three years ago, maybe? I'm trying to think how long ago it was. Um, contemporary of Stephen Hawking, just to name drop. He had some very, very interesting theories about that it does not need an observer to roll the dice, that actually the mass of the system and mass, the more massive the system, the sooner the dice gets rolled. And so it turns out that a photon can be undecided for like the age of the universe, okay? Whereas a cat can only be undecided for about a nanosecond, okay? And, 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 and it's not an observation, it's a self-collapse. But no one's proven these things one way or other. Any other questions? It, what happens to a bright light photon when it travels through an infrared lens and then cannot be seen at all by the naked eye? Well, it the, 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 can't be seen by the naked eye, but, but I, luckily, luckily for me, I have an expensive camera that does see it. Um, so, I mean, the, 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 that whole sort of um, photon wave, wave particle duality, um, I mean, gamma rays, are extremely particulate that come along you know knock things to smithereens by the time you get no one's ever observed a radio frequency photon i can count i can buy a camera my iphone camera can count photons near as damn it not quite i can certainly buy a camera for twenty thousand pounds that will count visible photons just go that was four. Oh no that was six once you get into the infrared you can count photons, it gets hard. No one's ever counted a radio frequency photon because the energy is so small, there's just so many of them. That, um, so lots of experimental evidence for photons, everything from gamma rays, X-rays, UV, infrared, terahertz, meh, radio waves, meh. But I don't think many people would doubt their existence. It's just that no one's done an experiment that ever shows the particle behavior of a radio wave. Okay, uh, uh, near the back in the red t-shirt, please. So, again, the, the role of the observer is still really an experimental unknown. And so I, I can't tell you whether the collapse of the wave function, the rolling of the dice, the, the left fringe, middle fringe, right fringe, I can't tell you whether that occurs when the photon hits the screen or when I look at the screen. I, I, no experiment has been ever devised that allows me to distinguish between the moment something happened and the moment I saw it. All I know is it happened after it went through the polarizer. So that picture of the polarizer essentially pushes the decision point to when we saw the, the horizontal line appear on the screen. Now, if you'd seen it appear on the screen, but you didn't tell me to tomorrow morning, I can't, I, I have to make assumptions about you being a sentient being or, or I mean, it gets philosophically very, very difficult to go, when, it, when did it become true? I know when it became true to me, which is the point of my observation. I will take your word for it that it became true to you, but maybe, hey, we all live in a matrix and who knows, but... You know, I know it was ambiguous for at least the time it went through the polarizer, because that's what the that's what the that's what the Alan Aspey experiment showed us. We don't know when it decided, but we know it still hadn't decided when it had gone through the polarizer. 
Whether it was last night or this morning, I don't know. So the role of the observer and who qualifies as an observer or what camera might qualify as an observer, nobody, nobody has been as yet able to think of an experiment that would distinguish the two. Not that I want to make a difference. You know, I said earlier, which is maybe a bit naughty of me, and I apologize to the philosophers that I, that I was sort of saying somehow as equating philosophy with something that can't be experimentally tested. And I shouldn't have done that. And I'm sorry about that. But I think we all recognize there are things that we can experimentally test. And there are things that we might hypothesize about, but we can't test. We might think we understand how these things work, but we haven't devised the test to check. Yeah, two thirds of the way down, blue jackets, get a trim, please. Thank you. Uh, you've stopped at entanglement. I'm sure there's more to say about that. Um, and in particular, is this just a new word for action at a distance? Um, so there's lots and lots of terms that people bandy around. Um, incidentally, probably the first entrance in popular culture, I gave this book to Alan as a present, by the way. There's a series of books I'm sure many of you come across called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, written by Douglas Adams, and he wrote those in the mid to late 80s. And in the restaurants at the end of the universe, there's this line there. I won't bother to read it out, but you can see here about talking about, I can work out what's happening everywhere in the universe by looking at any one bit of it because the universe is entangled in spooky action at a distance. So I think it's the, it's the first sort of reference in popular culture to, to Alan's work, although clearly more complicated than photons. And I always think of Mr. Kipling's little takes when it comes to these things. Um, what is entanglement? I, I said something sort of as a little bit of a throwaway, but I really meant it. I've got these two coins and I can flip this one and it's heads or tails. I can flip this one and it's heads or tails. But I've said there's something strange here that if I flip this one and it's heads, this one's always tails. And you think, well, how would I do that? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll make some little radio controlled coin. <laughs> this one lands down and it knows its heads. It then communicates by radio waves or something to this coin over here. And this one flips itself to tails. God knows how I'm going to do that. Experimentally impossible. But I can sort of think that it might be possible. And you go, well, but, 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 but Miles, you didn't flip them at the same time. Because you flip that one and then this one had to sort of communicate and nothing can travel faster than the speed of light so that that one won't be tails until a little bit later. Now, actually, one of the things that Alan did and the thing that was really important, and I didn't explain it just because of time, it's really important that you make both these measurements at the same time. Otherwise, you can imagine the whole thing gets smart and this photon goes, aha, I'm horizontal. You, you over there. Be vertical. <laughs> okay, and this is about this, and that's now, and that's like faster than light, spooky action at a distance. And this property we call entanglement is that these two things are always opposite. One is heads, the other is tails, no matter how far apart I make them. I am not limited by the speed of light and causality going from one to the other. And so when people talk about these experiments, what is important is that I, I have observer one over here and we're sitting here with our watch and we're going to measure that photon at exactly 12 o'clock midnight. And the observer over here is going to go and I'm going to measure it at exactly the same time. And because Einstein told us nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, there is no way ever that my measurement here has somehow told that one what to do. Because these two things were entangled, coming back to your magic word entanglement, they were always opposite no matter how far I separated them. 
And now you can see why Einstein had such issues with entanglement, because of course he told us nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So the idea that these two things can be separated from each other and yet still be perfectly correlated caused him some concern. And the, the get out is that there's nothing I can do to transmit information. And so really, when we say nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, what we really mean is information can't travel faster than the speed of light. What do I mean by information? I mean, do you want tea or coffee? That's information. How am I going to communicate? Just, if I, all I've got here is, if this one's tea, that one's coffee. But I've got no control. I can't make that one coffee or make that one tea. All I know is, it's like going, I've got a, I've, my one, I've got one coin. I don't have one coin. No, 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 I shake it up. And I go, da -da, there's a coin in this hand. I know there isn't, but pretend there is. Is there a coin in that hand? You go, no, of course there isn't. Because I've only got one coin and that'd be fine. So this, this idea of a non-local correlation is not really spooky. It's just conservation of coins. The pound is not in my bank account and your bank account at the same time. Actually, thanks to the banking system, it's probably in neither of our bank accounts. <laughs> it's, in, it's in their bank account and they're making interest on our transaction. But it certainly wasn't in yours or my account at the same time. Now, that's not spooky or quantum. It's just conservation. It's just there's not information there. Okay, on the left-hand side towards the back. Uh, it seems to me that wouldn't it be simpler if the properties were defined at the point of creation and they were just defined as opposite at that point. So but in which case, if it were defined as opposite at that point, I could get lucky. Because if they were defined to be 45 and minus 45, this one comes along, there's a 50-50 chance it gets through the polarizer. This one comes along, there's a 50-50 chance it gets through a polarizer. So there's a one in four yeah, but chance. No, but, that no, but there happen. would be some hidden variable that would make them have the same decision. So what, the, the, okay, so, so that would, okay, so the, the hidden variable theory that I've just, I, I don't know, I don't know whether I quite agree with you there. I mean, I agree that the, the experiments that people actually do are a little bit more subtle. Incidentally, just as a little aside, brilliant, best question I've ever been asked by anybody. I went like, isn't this interesting? You never get photons at the same time and I, there was this kid a young young school kid had his hand up he said mm, how do you know your experiment's just not broken <laughs> such a bloody good question um I go well, well yeah, there's a null test you do I maybe should have mentioned that um if I was 45 degrees I'm 45 degrees I would have a 50-50 chance. Now, what, what you're saying is, but how would I, if I, I pre-program, are you saying that I pre-program the outcome of the coin toss? No, the, the, yeah, well, yes, in a way, yeah, but it was, they were the, they were the same for each, or the opposite for each, um, each, you know, so I, I, what I think mean is for you, from your light bulb, how it creates, two photons going in opposite directions. So but whatever that mechanism is, there must be some way then that they were, it sounds like they were reciprocal products of something. So yeah, I mean, undoubtedly the, the, these correlations exist because of conservation laws, whether it be energy momentum or angular momentum. I still don't quite get what you're, you're saying. In that, if I, I go along here, I've got a 50-50 chance here yeah. and a 50-50 chance there. No, but you don't because the one, the decision has already been made by the hidden variable and they are reciprocal to each other. So you're conserving their choices. I will need to think about that some more. <laughs> So e email, e let's, let's email me, we'll, we'll chat. Another question halfway down on the left, please. 
Um, I guess it's kind of linked to that question, but if you're observing the 45 degree, but you can't really observe it because by the time you've observed it, it's horizontal. How do you know that there are 45 degree photons A existing or B coming out of the light bulb in order to say that, that, that they've decided? Thankfully, I can answer that question. <laughs> Grant. <laughs> um, so the experiment I've described it to you is not quite the experiment that is done for reasons that you say, but what you actually do is you go, I'm going to have my polarizers like this and my experiment runs. And then I run exactly the same experiment, but I go, actually, I'm not going to have my polarizers like this. I'm going to redefine what I mean by vertical and horizontal. I'm going to have my polarizers like this. Or I'm going to have my polarizers like that. The important thing is, no matter how I orient these polarizers, I never, you know, if it, you might say, well, maybe your thingy only gives you out horizontal and vertically polarized photons and never gives you out 45 ones. I'll go, fine, I'll just rotate the polarizers by 45 degrees and we'll go again. And I find exactly the same results. So the the, the experimental result is rotationally invariant in that sense. And the key, and this is incidentally what Alan did, which basically differentiated. So John Clauser did the first experiments back in the 70s. Alan in the 80s had his polarizers and then kept on changing them very quickly. And he changed them at a rate which was quick compared to the time it took for the photons to get from the source to the polarizers. Because the argument had been that this polarizer is telling the photons what to do at the source, that somehow there was a back communication from the setting of the experiment that was telling the source what to do. No one knew how that would be or understood the physical mechanism or, or any law of physics that would allow it to happen but there could potentially be a back communication to go just do horizontal and vertical photons, okay? Don't do these stupid 45 degree ones because they might, they might fail. And so you go, well, actually, I'm going to trick it into, it thinks it's doing these, but now I'm going to make it do the, those. And it doesn't matter what orientation, you never get the simultaneous count. So that, and it was that rapid switching of the polarizers, which was Alan's inventive step for which he ultimately was awarded the Nobel Prize, beyond the work of Clauser, who had done it with fixed polarizers. And then Anton Zeilinger's contribution, if we're going through that, why did he get a share? Turns out there's also a loophole. If your experiment only works some of the time, you don't necessarily have a fair sample. And so you just got lucky effectively again in some very bizarre way and so An Anton Seilinger did it with detectors which are effectively 100% efficient he measured all of the photons Alan didn't measure all of the photons most of his photons came out and the detector didn't work effectively and so Clauser did the first experiments, which we would do now in the lab, in our undergraduate labs and just go, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's shown. And everyone would accept it now, rightly or wrongly, as a demonstration of the Bell inequality. Alan removed one loophole, which is the non-local, the non-local by being very quick with his polarizers. And Anton then removed the second loophole, which was the, um, the fair sampling loophole. Sorry, a bit, a bit specialist, but. That was the citation on the Nobel Prize. Thank you very much. I think I'd now like to invite our president, Pat, to give the vote of thanks and award the Kelvin Medal. Oh, what a, what a, what a pleasant surprise. <laughs> you should have been able to predict it, my own. No, <laughs> I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Um, 
I've been watching, <laughs> I've been watching Lord Kelvin and I could see him frown now and again and shake his head. And you can't tell me that I didn't. No. Um, Miles has told us about something that's very complex. And he's done a very good job, I think, in simplifying, simplifying these complex things for us. Not necessarily that it made it, made it crystal clear to us <laughs> what the explanation is, because he also had to tell us the difference between unknown and unknowable. And that's quite hard in a way to get your head round. And while I was listening to the questions and so on, I, I was thinking about science. And being a biologist, I tend to think of science as something that is exact and precise, and that what we're looking for is the truth and certainty. But when it comes to physics, it seems to be a bit different. And it made me think that when Lord Kelvin was doing physics, it was called natural philosophy. And then it turned into physics, which made it sound a bit more precise. But I think it's coming back to being maybe not natural philosophy, maybe unnatural philosophy, because uh, sometimes Miles used the word uh, spooky and quantum as being one or the other, but sometimes quantum seems a bit spooky. Uh, so, Miles, I want to really thank you for making us all think about philosophy, about nature and how nature is dealing with this complexity. It, it made me think how surprising it is that animals can see because they don't even know whether it's a wave or a photon uh, that's coming at them. But nonetheless, we manage to make sense of our world. We tend to think there is causality. That's how we have to live our lives. And yet, maybe there isn't. Maybe it is all uncertainty. Probably that's the case. So, Miles, uh, on behalf of the audience, on behalf of Lord Kelvin, who's probably listening <laughs> somewhere, I'd like to award you the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow's Kelvin Medal. Thank you very much. And of course, the paperweight. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, please have a drink outside. Thank you.